Today I want to share with you how to make the best beef stew and avoid five common mistakes. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, it is unseasonably cold here again in central Texas and today we actually got snow and it was a good amount of snow. We were very surprised. It's something that's so unusual for where we live, but I thought it would be a perfect day to make a beef stew. Now today I want to share with you how to make a really great beef stew. And I also want to share with you the five common mistakes that people tend to make when first making a beef stew. So if you're new to this type of cooking, I think you'll find this very interesting. First I'll go over all the ingredients with you that you're going to need to make this beef stew. But don't worry about writing anything down because if you open the description under this video, just look for the word recipe. There'll be a link there. If you click on that, that'll take you over to my website, same name as my YouTube channel, Mary's Nest, and you can read the recipe online or you can print it out. Now the first thing that you're going to need is about a half a cup of some type of fat to brown your meat in. What I've got here is tallow. It's beef fat. But you could also use butter or a combination of butter and olive oil or just olive oil. Uh, you could also use ghee, which is clarified butter. So there are various options uh, to you, available to you, to brown your meat. Uh, the only thing that I would probably shy away from would be something like coconut oil because the taste of the coconut oil may impart an unusual flavor not generally found in a beef stew. The next thing you're going to need is your meat. And this is often where people make their first mistake. The nice thing about beef stew is it's a very reasonable dish to make because you want to use the more reasonable tough cuts of meat. And one of the best cuts to use when making beef stew is chuck. Chuck is tough and it's marbled with fat. But what happens is when you cook this slow and low, the fat melts slowly and the meat softens beautifully. So save your money and don't buy those leaner steaks, those beautiful sirloins. Save those for the grill because if you cut up a sirloin and you cook it low and slow, it's going to be tough as leather. Next, you're going to want some salt and pepper and some bay leaves. I like to add bay leaves in when I'm making a beef stew. But other than that, I don't add any additional seasoning. I really just let the meat and the vegetables shine through. Next, you're going to want some type of flour to dust your meat with when we go to brown it. And this is the one time that I really recommend using some type of white or plain flour. In this case, I've just got an all-purpose flour, but it's an all-purpose flour that's called Wondra flour, and it's milled to be very, very fine. So it's wonderful for whenever you're dusting meats. It's also great for making gravy and thickening stews. So when we dust it and then we brown it and we add our liquid and we're looking for something a little thicker, this is just one of those type of flours that works really well. However, if you can't find Wonder Flour at your grocery store, although it's pretty common in the baking section, but if you can find it, don't worry, all-purpose flour will work great. Then after we brown our meat, we're gonna need something to deglaze it. And we're gonna need one cup. And I, what I've got right here is one cup of port. It's a fortified wine. And the reason I have port is because I generally don't have red wine around the house because we don't drink. And if you open a bottle of red wine and just use a cup for a recipe, you know, it could turn to vinegar in your pantry. So I like to keep the fortified wines like port and Madeira, Marsala, things like that uh, on hand. I use them very frequently when making bone broth. If you've made bone broth with me, you've seen me do that. Uh, now, if you don't use alcohol to cook, I understand completely. What you can use in place of this is a combination of maybe half apple juice and half water, or you could use just water and put a little apple cider vinegar uh, into the water. Because basically what you're looking for to deglaze the pan and to also uh, have with the meat in the stew is a little bit of acid, which really helps pull all of the nutrients uh, out of the meat that help thicken the stew. 
And basically what you're looking for is for that little bit of acid to pull any uh, collagen that may be in the meat. Uh, and then when it cooks, uh, cooked collagen is gelatin. And so it makes the gravy that the beef uh, stew is in uh, even more nutritious and very beneficial. And you might be wondering, well, what does it matter if I'm eating the meat the collagen is in there and I'm getting that nutrition and that's true but it's easier for our stomachs to absorb if we try to pull out that collagen from the meat and create a little bit more of a gelatinous broth which is very soothing uh, to our, the, the lining of our gut and also helps us digest the meat better. Now the other things that we're going to need are a pound and a half of potatoes, a pound and a half of carrots, a pound and a half of onions and I've got here I've got a pound of green uh, peas and then over here I've got a pound and a half of mushrooms. Now don't worry if this seems like a lot of food to you you can definitely cut this recipe in half but I think when it comes to making beef stew it's better to make a lot because if you're feeding a crowd great but say you're feeding a smaller family, that's no problem because this freezes beautifully. So you can cut this, you can just serve half and then save the other half and put it into your freezer and it'll freeze beautifully and it'll stay fine for at least three months. Then on those nights when you're tired, all you have to do is pull out your free frozen beef stew, put it into a pot, turn the heat on low and let it defrost and, and warm up at the same time. The next ingredient that you're going to need is about eight cups of some type of liquid. Now what I've got here is beef bone broth. Now if you don't have beef bone broth, don't worry. You can use just a simple uh, beef broth. And if you don't have either uh, beef bone broth or beef broth, you can simply use water. Now for this meat, I've got two pounds of chuck here that's cut up. If you buy your chuck and you're able to find it on the bone and you're going to cut up uh, your own chunks to make this beef stew, save that bone and go ahead and put it into your uh, Dutch oven. We, I've got a large Dutch oven here or a stock pot, whatever you have that you know can hold everything. And that will help add additional nutrition to your beef stew. And that's especially helpful if you don't have some beef bone broth or beef broth already made that you're going to be using as your liquid. So if you're using water, but you've got that uh, bone from your chuck roast, go ahead and throw that right in. And whatever acid medium you use will help pull nutrients out of that bone, further adding nutrition to your beef stew. Finally, if you want, you can use some Italian flat leaf parsley as a little bit of garnish, but that's totally up to you. Now the first thing that we want to do is make sure our cubes of chuck are nice and dry. And then we're going to go ahead and toss them in our bowl in our Wonder Flour and some salt and pepper. And at the same time I prepare this chuck, I'm going to go ahead and put my burner onto a medium heat and I'm going to go ahead and get my tallow start melting. Now we're going to probably need about a half a cup of flour to make sure that we get a real nice coating on our, our, on our chuck meat here. So I'll go and put that half cup of flour in there and then I'm going to add two teaspoons of salt to my flour. And if you are on a salt restricted diet, yes, you can leave that out or you can put in less. Uh, it's really just a matter of taste. And uh, you can also use those no salt products or something like that, that's fine. And then I'm just going to put in a couple of grinds here of some nice fresh black pepper. I'm just going to mix that around well with my hand. And now I'm just going to start putting in the beef and get it nicely coated. Now that we've got all of our meat beautifully coated and my tallow is nice and hot, you can hear it sizzling a little in there already, I'm going to go ahead and start searing our meat. Now we want to take our time doing this and we don't want to overcrowd the pan because this is number two where we can make a mistake. What happens is people will forget to sear the meat 
and they'll just go ahead and throw it all in and then start adding their liquid and so on and so forth. And if you don't get a nice brown crust on your meat, you won't get a nice sauce that your meat is in making the wonderful stew and it'll lack flavor. So it's very important that we go ahead and start browning our meat. Well, we're gonna let those brown on one side. It'll take maybe two to three minutes. Then we're gonna flip them over and let them brown on the other side. You're just looking for a nice golden brown coating. And when this first batch is done, I'm gonna transfer it to my platter here, and then we'll finish up the second batch, and then we'll get ready to go on to the next step. Well, we've got our first batch of chuck beautifully browned. It took about two, three minutes on each side, and now I'm gonna brown the rest of it. Well, I finished browning up this second batch of meat. Now I'm just going to go ahead and add in this little bit of extra flour that I've got in here. That'll help further thicken our stew. And I'm just going to toss the meat in it uh, along with the fat that the meat is browning in just to kind of help uh, cook that flour just a little bit. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in our first batch along with all the juices back into our Dutch oven there and give everything a little toss around. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add in my port to deglaze the pan and get all those lovely little bits off the bottom. And you can certainly use red wine if you've got it, or you know, as I said, any of the fortified wines, the Madeira, uh, the Marsala, they all work wonderful. Red vermouth could work. And if you don't want to Use any alcohol, as I said, you know, a little apple juice and water, or just water maybe with a little touch of vinegar in it. So once you deglaze the pan and you get all those bits up from the bottom, you wanna go ahead and add in your bone broth or your broth or your water, whatever you're using. And once you add in your liquid, and I added eight cups, I find that works well with the two pounds of meat. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add in my four bay leaves. And I'm just going to mix this all around. Now we're going to bring this up to a boil. And once it comes up to a boil, we're going to put the lid on. And then we're going to turn it down to low. And we're going to let this simmer low and slow for an hour and a half. Well, I let this simmer for an hour and a half. And I'm confident that that meat is going to be delightfully tender. Now we're going to start adding in some of our vegetables. I'm going to go ahead and put in my carrots. And basically what I did was I took a shortcut and I've got these cute little carrots that come already cut and peeled for you at the grocery store. That's a nice little shortcut, but certainly if you're just adding regular carrots that you peeled and cut, that's fine too. Then I'm going to go ahead and add in my potatoes. I've just got these little baby round ones, but if you're using larger potatoes, uh, you just want to cut them up into cubes and you can, depending on uh, what type of skin they have, uh, you can either peel them or leave them unpeeled, whatever you want to do. Now I'm going to go ahead, I just got white button mushrooms that I've just sliced in half and I'm going to go ahead and add those in. Oh, this looks fabulous. So oh, sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> And then I've got this fella here, and I'm just going to give this all a good stir. And then I'm going to put, I'm going to bring it back up to a boil, and then I'm going to put the lid on and let this all simmer for 30 minutes. Well, I let the vegetables simmer in the stew with the meat for 30 minutes. And that's an important point to note because that can be mistake number three putting your vegetables in too early. If you put your vegetables in at the beginning, as you, with your meat, when your meat is cooking, the meat will be fine, but the vegetables will disintegrate. So you want to put your vegetables in, at least in the case of the carrots and the potatoes and the mushrooms, in the last 30 minutes. And so now our stew has been cooking for a total of two hours. And that brings us to another mistake that sometimes folks can make. It's mistake number four. And that's not cooking your stew long enough. A stew like this needs to cook for about two hours. Now, when you spin this around or stir this around uh, with your carrots and your mushrooms and your uh, potatoes in there, you want to look at the consistency of the liquid of your stew. 
Now, it may still be a little on the watery side, and that's okay, because when you add in your vegetables, your carrots, your mushrooms, and your potatoes, you do want them to have somewhat of a liquid uh, base, so to speak, to cook in. If your stew was very thick at this point, it would be difficult for them to cook thoroughly without the potential for your liquid to score, your thickened liquid to scorch on the bottom of your pan. So don't worry when you take your lid off and you say, oh, it's not, it's not quite as thick as I'd like. That's all right, I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do next. This is important to have this consistency to allow those vegetables to cook through and to cook through without having anything scorch on the bottom. Now what you want to do at this point, and we'll talk about the peas and the onions in a minute, but what you want to do at this point is take a tablespoon of butter and a tablespoon of flour, possibly the Wonder Flour if you're using that, and you just want to knead it with your fingers into, into a bowl like this. So you take a tablespoon of butter, tablespoon of flour, and knead it into a little ball like this. Then you're gonna go ahead and drop this right down into your stew, and you're going to stir this to help that butter flour ball completely dissolve. And as you do that, you're going to see your stew start to thicken up nicely. That little flour butter ball is gonna dissolve beautifully, and then you just wanna bring your mixture up to a boil and just make sure you're stirring so that nothing sticks to the bottom and you're going to see that it's going to thicken up beautifully. And you can tell that this has thickened up beautifully by just taking a spoon, dipping it in. You can just give it a second to cool. My fingers are so uh, used to very hot temperatures. But if you just give it a little second to cool and then if you run your finger down the middle of the back of the spoon, you'll see that the uh, stew sauce, <laughs> for lack of a better word, this two sauce stays separated. And so you'll know it's got a nice thick consistency. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add in my onions. And like how I took a little bit of a shortcut with my carrots, I also took a shortcut with the, with the onions. And what I've got are the little pearl onions. They just come in the frozen section. Now, if you were using uh, onions, whole onions that you peeled and cut up into chunks, you would have wanted to have gone ahead and added those at the 30 minute mark, uh, well an hour and a half had passed, but to cook for 30 minutes along with your mushrooms and your carrots and your potatoes. But since these are frozen, they're already cooked and they're just so small little pearl onions, I'm going to go ahead and add these in and just so that they can warm through. And now we'll also go ahead and add in our peas just to let them get warmed through. Now, what do you think mistake number five is? It doesn't exactly have to do with making the stew. It has to do with serving the stew. Serving the stew by itself doesn't give you anything to sop up all that wonderful stew sauce or stew gravy. So some options for serving it are some nice big thick slices of sourdough bread or my family's favorite, egg noodles. So what I like to do is get a nice soup bowl and fill it very generously with some nice egg noodles. And I like to use the wide ones. Now we're gonna get this fabulous stew, which is all done and start putting this, ladling this over our delicious egg noodles. And I wanna make sure I get plenty of that delicious sauce, gravy, <laughs> for those egg noodles to sop all that up. But look at that, just glorious. Now, if you want, you can just take a few of your flat leaf Italian parsley, if you want. The green peas give it some lovely color, but just for a little freshness of flavor, you can sprinkle some of that on. And doesn't that look great? Now, I wanna bring you in closer because I want to take a piece of this meat and I just want to show you on the cutting board how tender this is. Just look at that meat. Um, you don't need a fork, you don't need a knife. You can literally just break it with the spoon. So tender. Now let's give this a little taste and uh, we'll try to get a little bit of this 
gravy in here and we got an onion and an egg noodle <laughs> and we'll try to get a carrot let's see this is going to be a healthy a healthy mouthful but let's give it a try mmm mmm oh oh that's so good the meat is so tender this is really delicious and perfect for a cold night that we're like we're having tonight here in Central Texas. Well, if you'd like more recipes for wonderful home cooked meals like this, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a whole playlist of comfort foods. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.